He is risen. Yes, he is risen indeed. Welcome everyone and happy Easter. This is one of the most important times of the year, one of the most important celebrations that we could ever have. In fact, I believe it is the most important. Easter is such an important, valuable, beneficial time for us who follow Christ as Lord and Savior. And as we communicate that to others, that is something that is easier to do when we're celebrating a time such as this. And I hope that you know, our society can become more and more aware of what it is that we believe and, and why we believe it. So that's where we are. I'm going to pray to get started. We're going to be looking at all four of the Gospels to some extent, but I'm focusing most on Matthew 28, the first 15 verses. And um, hope you get your Bible and prepare to uh, look at God's Word with me today as we consider the, um, the foundation of our faith, that is the resurrection of Christ. And it's, today it's called the, the, the reality of the empty grave, or an empty grave. And that's a reality, and that's something we need to consider. We're going to look at the evidence. We're going to look at the, what we find in God's Word and realize that the evidence gives an effect upon our lives as well. So pray with me, please. Our gracious Father, I thank you for the wondrous celebration we have in recognizing the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. The death is vital because that pays the, punish, pen, the punishment for our sins. The burial is vital because that's a fulfillment of Scripture, who's to be buried. And the resurrection is vital. The burial is essential because that's why we know there's a resurrection, because he was buried. But Father, we, we thank you for these truths. We thank you for this reality. And I pray that we might be able to worship and honor you today in what we say and do in this message. But I pray, too, that our lives can be transformed and uh, encouraged by the reality that there's an empty grave in outside of Jerusalem. There's, uh, there's a Savior, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who's seated at your right hand, our Father. We thank you for that. And we look forward to his return to come and, and take us there to heaven to be with him. But today I pray that you'd use what is being expressed and being taught from this passage of Scripture and these other sections of Scripture that relate and use this to build our faith, use this to motivate our faith and motivate our desire to reach others with the good news. And Father, use this to be a springboard for us for the entire year because this is so vital. We, we love you, we praise you, we thank you. And I ask now that your presence upon me, your presence upon those that are listening, your presence upon every follower of Christ, that that might be more and more evident because we've celebrated the wondrous truth that Jesus Christ came, he died a horrible death, he was buried in a borrowed grave, and he came back from that grave, and he is Lord and Master and he is Savior, and he's sovereign, and we thank you, we praise you, and we pray these things in his precious and holy name, and all God's people said, Amen. I'm sure many of you are familiar with Josh McDowell. <clears throat> Years ago, Josh McDowell was essentially a uh, skeptical agnostic. He was probably right on the edge of being an atheist, and he had really no use for Christianity. And he set out to disprove the resurrection. He was tired of hearing about it. He set out to disprove the resurrection. He basically believed the idea, and this is a true thought, that if anyone can blow up the resurrection, they, they make Christianity explode. We find that in, in 1 Corinthians 15, and we're going to just mention that here in a few moments again. But Josh McDowell set out to prove that the resurrection was not true, that it never took place. But he was absolutely amazed at what God showed him in his attempt. He went from being that skeptical, agnostic, almost atheist, to being one of the greatest supporters and um, evangelists 
that could ever live and that has ever lived. He's still alive today. He's still an, uh, an apologist that, that teaches the truth of God's word in order to help people understand why we believe and, and what it is that's most important. And I, I just acknowledge that. But we, we need to understand, 1 Corinthians 15 says that uh, without the resurrection of Christ, Christianity is worthless. And that's an amazing thought. And yet, we realize that in our world today, there are many, many people that profess to believe in Jesus in some fashion. They profess to be a Christian of some sort, but yet they are a Christless Christian because they don't really believe in the Jesus Christ that died on the cross for our sins. They say, oh, that's all nice, but yet they look at other aspects. So he was a great moral teacher. He was a great example. And... To me, that's a Christless Christianity. And there are so many people that live that perspective. They live out that type of a philosophy. But we need to understand that without the resurrection, Christianity is worthless. So therefore, today we're going to be looking at Matthew 28, verses 1 through 15. We're going to read that now. We're going to be looking at a few other sections, a verse or two from Mark, a verse or two from Luke, and a verse or two from John. We're going to consider these various passages of Scripture, and we're going to note the fact that there's a reality in the Middle East, outside of Jerusalem, where there's an empty grave. I don't know if they know exactly where that grave was. I know there's a lot of different people that, that take tours and they see these things, but yet um, that empty grave points out to the fact that Jesus Christ, He's not there He's seated at God's right hand in heaven, and we realize that. So, follow along if you would. I'm going to read Matthew 28, verses 1 through 15. Please follow with me, and uh, let's respect God's word and the fact that this is God's truth. It says, Now after the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to look at the grave. And behold, a severe earthquake had occurred, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone and sat upon it. And his appearance was like lightning, and his clothing was as white as snow. It was brilliant. The guards shook with fear of him and became like dead men. And the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who has been crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, just as he said. Come see the place where he was lying. Go quickly, tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. <clears throat> behold, I have told you. And he left the tomb quickly with fear, or they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy. Notice that mixture of emotion, fear and great joy and ran to report it to the disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and greeted them, and they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and take word to my brothers to leave for, for Galilee, and there they will see me. Now while they were on their way, some of the guard came into the city and reported to the chief priests all that had happened. And when they had assembled with the elders and consulted together, they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers and said, You are to say his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. And if this should come to the ears of the governor, we will win him over and keep you out of trouble. So they took the money and did as they had been instructed. And this story was widely spread among the Jews and it's still being spread to the day when Matthew wrote that. And in some ways, that idea is still being spread in the false teachings of those that disagree or they, dis, they distrust the idea that Jesus Christ came as Lord and Savior and died for sin and rose from the dead. Now, we, we realize that this is Matthew's account. Now, all four accounts, if we look at them together, it's, it's difficult to piece them together in a chronological way. Because each of the gospel writers had his own, his own viewpoint. He wrote truthfully under the power of the Holy Spirit. 
And these writers wrote and explained the things that they knew about Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, and otherwise, the life of Christ as well. And there's no way in which these things should, should cause us uh, to question our faith because they very closely tie together and they're true. But now as we look at this today, we look at what we've read, I want us to understand the emphasis of this study that we're, we're going through right now is that the resurrection of Christ, I'll say this slowly, the resurrection of Christ is the most relevant event throughout all recorded history. That's what's happened in the past. I believe that the second coming of Christ is going to be a very monumental event. I believe the rapture is going to be a monumental event. So therefore, these things will also be very, very vital. But so far, the resurrection of Christ is the most relevant event throughout all recorded history. The reality of Christ's resurrection reveals that the Lord Jesus Christ is the Redeemer sent by God to rescue us from the retribution we all deserve for our rebellion against God's authority. That's the, the emphasis of this message, of this study today. Now, as we look at this, I want us to understand first, there's some background material, some things that that help us see the story very clearly. And that is from, in, in this particular instance, I'm using Matthew 26 and 27. I'm not going to read that. I'm just going to point out the truths that are there. Because the first thing we note is in 26, verses 69 through 75, Peter's denial. Now, Matthew, he apparently... He looked at all the emotional elements of what was going on. And he, he records Peter's denial, and he expresses the emotion of Peter, because when he denied knowing Jesus Christ, the slave girl came to him, the others came to him there in the garden, or actually in, in, the, in the courtyard, not in the garden, in the courtyard, and he was warming his hands at the fire, and there was that going on. They asked him, and he says, no. In fact, he used some language we wouldn't use right here. And Jesus turned and saw him. And when Jesus saw him and they caught eyes, Peter realized, oh, no. Now, Jesus had told him, you're going you're gonna to deny knowing me. And Peter says, that never happened. That'll never happen. But when it happened, he went out and wept bitterly. He, he, he felt as if, oh, what did I do? But now secondly, in Matthew 27, verses 1 through 10, we read of Judas's change of mind. He had betrayed Jesus Christ. He had a change of mind, but he didn't have, didn't have a change of heart. Because in his change of mind, he tried to give back the money. He couldn't give it back. He threw it, he threw it there toward the Jewish leaders. And the sad thing is he went out and committed suicide. He hung himself. Judas's emotional state, very, very uh, fragile. And he had a change of mind, but not a change of heart. He could have repented and said, I'm sorry. But he didn't. Thirdly, we see Pilate's conscience. He was the trial judge, so to speak, of Jesus Christ. And his conscience was, this man's innocent. His conscience was, this isn't right. He said, let's bring Barabbas and release him to the Jews. No, let's bring Jesus out. I'll, I'll bring Barabbas out. I got Jesus. Compare the two. We've got Barabbas on one side, Jesus on the other. And he said to the Jewish people, who do you want? I'm going to release someone. And the Jews said, release Barabbas. He thought, oh, no. that's, that's. So what did he do? He went and washed his hands. He felt guilty, and he tried to wash the guilt away by washing his hands. So we see that. But we also see in that the crowd's rejection of Jesus. They had the opportunity to take Jesus Christ as their king, and they rejected that. And we find next in Matthew 27, 27 through 32, the soldiers' mockery. They mocked him with the crown of thorns. They mocked him in the ways in which they treated him. They called him names. They, when they got to the cross, they, they were mocking him even still. 
and the mockery of the, of, of the soldiers is very significant. And there's Again, there's an emotional element of that. These guys were trying to get their, um, I don't know, their enjoyment out of something that was just terrible. But then we find the centurion's moment of truth. There was a centurion at the end, after the darkness, after all that took place, the centurion, he looked up at, at Jesus Christ on the cross, and he said, surely this man is the Son of God. A moment of truth for a centurion. We find Jesus' burial recorded in Matthew 27, 57 through 61. There's five verses, but it's very detailed over the fact that there were spices. They wrapped him, and Joseph of Arimathea came and, and took the body. He got permission and took the body, and he put Jesus in a grave that he, a tomb that he had purchased. And then finally, we have the Jewish leaders' worries over what had happened. And they said, well, he said he was going to come back from the dead in three days. And they were concerned, well, his disciples are going to come and steal the body. I don't know if they really thought that it was possible Jesus would rise from the dead or not. So their worry was, let's put guards up. And Joseph of Arimathea, he, he sealed the tomb with the stone, the large stone. But then the Jewish leaders, they sealed the tomb with some government seal, so to speak. I'm not sure exactly what that was. I've heard different elements of how that might have been, and I'm not going to take the time of describing that right now. But they sealed the tomb off, and they put guards in front. They put guards there. So we know all that as the lead-up to what we find in what I read in Matthew 20, 28. And what we find in that, 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 that passage of Scripture, we find, first of all, uh, six different cues, not cue sticks, but cues, the letter Q, that describe what goes on there. Number one, the quest of several ladies. Mary, Mary Magdalene, and other ladies too, we find in Luke and, and John, they went to the grave. They had watched Jesus when he was buried. Actually, Mary and Mary Magdalene had watched Jesus when he was buried. They saw that take place. They went to the grave on Sunday morning after the Sabbath. And their quest was, Let it, let's anoint the body some more. Let's put spices on it. Now, we find in one of the passages... Mark and Luke both, where they're wondering, how are we going to get the stone away? They didn't understand that. So therefore, there was the quandary of the huge boulder. They wanted to anoint Jesus' body. Now, it's interesting. Jesus had told all their, his followers, I'm going to arise from the dead. And they didn't expect that. The quest was, let's treat his body well. And I'm not sure what their purpose was exactly in that, Just maybe just to honor Jesus. And the quandary was, how are we going to get rid of that boulder? But now there was a quake, a quake, an earthquake that opened the grave. An angel came down from heaven, and it says that the passage says, the angel rolled the stone away, that the angel and the rolling of the stone caused an earthquake. And that earthquake was very significant. There was an earthquake earlier on Friday during the time of the crucifixion. Then there's an earthquake now. And both of these were symbolic. They were signs from God that God was involved in the whole process. And the quake opened the grave. Now I want to understand something. The stone did not open the grave. Jesus Christ didn't need the stone to be rolled away. In fact, Jesus Christ probably left the grave before the stone was rolled away. The stone was rolled away so that people could see that the tomb was empty. That was an evidence that people could note that the body was gone. And then there's the quote that changed all history, and that is, I know you're here to find Jesus. You're looking for Jesus who's been crucified. He is not here, for he has risen from the dead. Come see the place where he was lying. That's the quote that changed all history, because that established the fact that Jesus Christ was no longer in the grave and gave evidence of that. And the, the, the ladies saw that. Later, Peter and John came to the tomb. They saw that. 
and they recognized the tomb was empty. And basically, these ladies that they heard the angel, they actually were greeted very gre briefly by Jesus. And they went to talk to the disciples, a quick trip to the disciples, not a gas station, a quick trip where they went to find the disciples and they went to tell them. And then what we find is, is the quieting instructions by Jesus himself, as, as, as we look at this passage, where Jesus said to them, do not be afraid, go and take word to my brothers to leave for Galilee, and they will see me there. Now, we know that took place later. There were more appearances by Jesus before the trip to Galilee. And in fact, the trip to Galilee, why is that significant in Matthew? Because the Great Commission in Matthew 28, 16 through 20, was given to the disciples in Galilee, in the mountain in Galilee where Jesus said to meet. But they had seen him before that. But yet it was significant as why he, Jesus knew he was going to give the Great Commission there in Galilee. And that's something we're going to look at next week. We're going to look at that and consider how does that affect our lives? How does that encourage our lives? But Jesus was quieting their fears by saying, hey, here I am. He gave them instructions. Tell the disciples, come meet me. Now, these are all significant. These are all important. These are the way in which we evaluate the evidence at face value. The quest of the ladies to go. Why were they going to go? Well, they were going to anoint the body. They had the quandary, how are we going to get rid of the stone? The quake had opened the grave. And the grave was open not so Jesus could get out, but rather so that people could see in. The quote that changed history from the angel, he is not here for he is risen from the dead. The quick trip to go find the disciples so they could tell them. And then the quieting instructions from Jesus himself, they were fearful and they were joyful at the same time. They didn't know what to think. This was all so overwhelming that it was amazing to them. And there's so much more I could say. There's so much more I could explain. But I want to be as concise as possible in getting to the main element of this story, the main evidence of the fact that Jesus Christ came back from the dead and how that has an effect on our lives. That is where we're going with this message. But now, as we look at this passage in Matthew 28, the next thing we see is we examine the evidence that's false. And that's all around us all the time. There are people that deny Jesus Christ as being the Lord and Savior that he is. There are people that deny the fact that Jesus Christ was God. There are people that deny the fact that Jesus Christ died and rose from the grave. There are people that question all of this, and that number of people seems to be growing in our society today. It shouldn't be, but yet it is. And we need to examine the evidence that's false and say, okay, it took place then, but there's a last word there that says this has been spread. And when Matthew wrote it, it was spread to the very day Matthew wrote that. But these false teachings are still spreading today. And we need to realize that because we are those that have trusted in Jesus Christ. We recognize what he's done for us. And we go out and tell the world that great news. But the guards, it's interesting what happened it says, while the ladies were on their way to find the disciples, the guards went to the city. Some of the guards went to the city. And rather than going to the Roman officials or going to Pilate, Pontius Pilate, they went to the Jewish leaders. They went to the wrong authorities. Now, we say that because they should have gone to the authorities, the government authorities, and say, hey, wait a minute now, the body is gone. We don't know what happened. They could have told the truth. Now, they told the truth. They basically took the facts to the wrong authorities. And the authorities established this foolish bribe that made absolutely no sense whatsoever. It says, you are to say to people, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. Okay, how did they know that if they were asleep? That makes no sense. 
And if they were asleep on the job, then basically that means their, their, their heads were to be cut off. They were to be executed for failing to fulfill their duties. Now, the Jewish leader says, we will provide cover for you. In fact, here's a bribe. Here's some money. Go out and tell the lies. Don't tell the truth. Tell the lies. And basically, this is a fictional story that spread, and it kept on spreading. And we have many people today, we rub shoulders with people that question the veracity of the, the, the crucifixion and resurrection. They question that. They question whether Jesus Christ was who he said he was. And we live in a world that right now, what do we need? It's, it's desperate. The world needs Jesus Christ. They need the message of Christ. That's essential to make a difference in people's lives. And we'll see that in our conclusion here as we draw these things to a close here in a bit. But now, we also need to understand there's evidence that escaped his friends and followers. There's evidence that escaped his friends and followers. It wasn't a simple, okay, we believe, and we're just going to go out and do what, what Jesus had told us we were supposed to do before he died. In fact, they lost sight of what Jesus had told them before he died. And there was evidence that escaped his friends and followers. Mark 16, verse 8, where it says, They, the ladies, went out and fled from the tomb, they ran from the tomb because they were gripped with fear and astonishment. Once again, there's that mixture of emotion. They were fearful and they were amazed at the same time. And it says, because of the fear, they said nothing to anyone. That's how overwhelming this event was. That's how magnificent this whole circumstance was of what Jesus Christ came and accomplished. When he died on the cross, you know, it seems like we read in Isaiah, he was the suffering servant. Jesus said, I'm going to be arrested. I'm going to be crucified. He said, all the, it seems like his father would say, yes, yes, yes. But there was confusion. They were overwhelmed. There was concern. There was evidence that escaped their notice. And then in verse, 16, verse 10 and 11 of Mark 16, it says, the lady... Mary went and reported to those who'd been with him while they were mourning and weeping. They were so distraught. They were so discouraged. They didn't know what to think. They were afraid of the Jewish leadership. They were afraid, what's going to happen? And you know what? We have people today. They see things going on in our culture. They see things going on with our government. They see things going on overseas. And they question, are we safe? They question, are things going to be okay? And we have word from our Lord Jesus. We have word from God Almighty in the scriptures, from the Holy Spirit who helped us, the writing of the scriptures, from the authors that were inspired by the Spirit. We have word that God has everything under control. And yet, there's always that sense of skepticism, that sense of question. What if? Why not? Why God? And Jesus' followers, especially his disciples at the very beginning, they refused. It says very clearly in Mark 16, verse 11, he was alive, he had been seen by Mary, and yet they refused to believe it. They refused. They were adamant. That can't be. They just said, this isn't right. Something's wrong here. But now, we need to see in John 20, Got three little sections of John 20 that provide for us the evidence that expanded their faith. The evidence that expanded, it grew their faith. They had been following Christ. They'd been disciples. They promised, we'll follow you to the very end. Peter promised that. Others did too. John, probably James, Andrew, others. Now it says in John 20, verses 19 and 20, it says, So when it was evening on that day, on that Sunday, on the day of the resurrection, the first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the disciples were, we don't know where that was, we don't know exactly the place, we're never told that. It says where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, that's why they were locked in the room, 
The doors were locked. They were fearful of the Jews. It says, Jesus came and stood in their midst. He walked right through the wall. He stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. And when he said this, he showed them both his hands and his side. And the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Suddenly, things became real to them. The reality of what Jesus had promised was it was true. Now, did they have all their questions answered? I don't believe so, because the Bible tells us there were still times of question. There was times of why is this going on this way and why is this happening that way? But by the time of Pentecost, which was 50 days later, 50 days later, we recognize that the disciples, they were believing, they were trusting. But now what was it that brought that all about? We see next John 20 verses 24 and 25, where it says, now Thomas, one of the 12, he wasn't with them when Jesus appeared to the 10, when he appeared to the 10. Thomas, one of the 12, called Didymus, Thomas is his Aramaic name. Didymus is his Greek name. Literally, both of those mean he was a twin. He had a twin brother. We don't know who that was, but nonetheless, it says, Thomas, who was not with them when Jesus came, so the other disciples were saying to him, we've seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see his hands and the imprint in his nails, on uh, the imprint of the nails in his feet and put my finger into the place of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Thomas is saying the same thing as the other disciples said when they heard what Mary said. They refused to believe. Thomas was refusing. And I want you, people to understand, I want us to recognize that our belief is not merely a matter of human will. Our belief is something that we need to cry out to God and say, help me to believe, help me to trust, help me to understand. We need God's help. We need God's intervention in these times. And Thomas, he says, I will not believe. But then we know that sometime a few days later, on the following Sunday, after eight days, his disciples were again inside and Thomas was with them that time. In fact, I like what Warren Wiersbe said. Thomas learned that you don't skip the gatherings of, God's fo of Christ's followers. You don't skip worship times. You don't skip church. Why? Because you're going to miss something when you, when you skip church, and you're going to want to know what it was. Thomas missed something. And he said, I won't believe. I can't believe right now. So the disciples were together. Thomas was with them. Jesus came, the doors once again having been shut, and he stood in their midst and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach here with your finger and see my hands, and reach here your hand and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. Now I'm going to stop there because I'm going to read the rest, but realize there's no way in Scripture here that it shows us that the disciples told Jesus what Thomas had said. Thomas said it to the others. He was adamant in his, in his thoughts. Jesus wasn't told that, but Jesus knew it. Jesus knew it. Jesus immediately went to Thomas and says, Hey, Thomas, here I am. You said you wouldn't believe unless you touched, unless you put your hand in my, in my side. Here. He says, reach here with your finger and see my hands and reach here with your hand and put it into my side. And do not be unbelieving, but rather believe, trust. Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, because you've seen me, have you believed? Because you've seen? And then Jesus makes a very profound statement there. Of course, it's Jesus. He's the only one that can make profound statements. He is the one that make prof makes profound statements. He said, Blessed are those who will not see and yet will believe. You know who that is? That's you. That's me. 
That's all followers of Christ in our culture today and all the followers of Christ throughout the centuries. Blessed are those who do not see, but yet they believe. And yet what we find here, as we look at this passage of Scripture, as we consider this today on Easter Sunday, we need to understand how our beliefs empower our behavior. Our beliefs empower our behavior. This is the application for the study today. So first, I want to detail the essential evidence proving the resurrection of Christ. There's evidence. It's clear. It's recorded in God's Word. And it's evidence that helps us to see, yes, absolutely, Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. But number one, the empty tomb. The, the ladies saw the empty tomb. Peter and John saw the empty tomb. We're not told how many of the other of the disciples saw the empty tomb. I'm sure that many went to see it. But the empty tomb, that is significant. He was laid in that tomb by Joseph of Arimathea. The rock was put outside the tomb. The rock was not moved in order for Jesus to get out. The rock was moved so that we would see the empty tomb. That's proof that Jesus Christ came back from the grave. But secondly, the empty grave clothes that were left behind. It's recorded here in the Gospels that when they saw, in fact, let me see right here in Matthew um, Okay, I'm sorry, it doesn't say it in Matthew. Um, I believe it's... I'll find it here in a moment. I have time. Not much, but a lot. I, no, I, I, jo I joke about that. I, you know... Okay, okay there. Peter got up and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in, Luke 24, and he saw the linen wrappings only. He went away to his home, marveling at what had happened. The linen wrappings were laying there. Jesus Christ had literally, he'd escaped the linen wrappings. Now, what this also does is this disproves even more so the lie that the Jewish leaders gave to the guards you know, why would the disciples steal the body and leave the grave clothes there? Because the Jewish people weren't allowed to touch dead bodies. And they would only be able to touch the grave clothes to be able, able to remain kosher, so to speak. So the empty grave clothes left behind, they prove, once again, he is risen from the dead. Thirdly, the earthquake. Earthquake the day he died, earthquake the day he arose. And the earthquake is documented in Scripture. The earthquake, it tells the fact that Jesus Christ, God's pointing out that I'm doing something right here. So the earthquake. Number four, the eyewitness appearances. 1 Corinthians 15 says that more than 500 people saw him after he arose from the grave. We have the disciples, we have the ladies, we have many others. The eyewitness appearances of those that saw Jesus Christ. That is essential evidence that proves the resurrection of Christ. But then finally, the effect this had on Jesus' faithful followers. Peter, I'll never deny you, he denied him. Peter, he was a man that... that, that he did several things that were so impulsive. And yet, when we see Peter after the resurrection, Peter after Jesus Christ restored him in John 21, Peter was a changed man. The effect this had on Jesus' faithful followers, the fact that people followed after Jesus Christ after he'd been arrested, crucified, and buried. Why would there be such faithful following? Why did it 
you know, it changes people's lives. Your life, my life, I'm sure we have been changed by the fact that we believe in the resurrection of Christ. So those are five essential evidence pieces that prove the resurrection of Christ. But now, what does this evidence establish for us? How does it affect our lives? How does it change the way that we live? Number one, it proves that Jesus existed and that he is the Son of God. So many people question that. But I know my Lord and Savior came and paid the price for my sins. I know that my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, lived a, a perfect life on earth and died a perfect death, cruel. It was filled with hatred by those that crucified him. But he died the perfect death. Why? Because it paid the price for my sin and yours. So it proves that he existed and that he is the Son of God. Secondly, it verifies the reliability of the Bible, prophecies throughout the Old Testament, prophetic teaching of Jesus. I'm going to be arrested. We're going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to be arrested. I will be tried. I will be sentenced to death. I'll be buried and I'll rise from the dead in three days. And it verifies the reliability of the Bible and exposes the exactness of God's revelation to us. God's revelation is exactly true. Why do I believe the rapture is true? Because the Bible teaches it. And it's exact. Why do I believe that Christ is coming back to set up his kingdom? Because the Bible teaches it. And it's exact. It exposes the exactment of God, exactness of God's revelation to us. The resurrection, it verifies the reliability of God's word and exposes the exactness of God's revelation to us. But thirdly, it affirms that Jesus is, is God's exclusive provision to save us from his judgment towards sin. There is no other way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And it affirms that Jesus is God's exclusive provision to save us from his judgment towards sin. It's exclusive. There is no other way. In Christ's name and in Christ's name alone, in Christ's blood and in Christ's blood alone, can we be redeemed and rescued. But number four, it emphasizes the fact, it emphasizes the fact that God and God alone enables us to live righteous and holy lives that please him. It emphasizes the fact that God and God alone enables us to live righteous and holy in such a way that will please him. And it's God's work in my life. It's, I can't do it by willpower. I can't do it by saying, well, I want to be righteous. I want to be righteous. I want to be righteous. It's God and God alone that enables us. <clears throat> <clears throat> Number five, it eliminates all doubt and disbelief that God has, has sovereign control. <clears throat> this eliminates any question whatsoever of God's sovereign control over this world. Christ came back from the grave. We have a sovereign God. He is fully in charge. We can trust him. We can believe him. So therefore, finally... The last idea I want to portray in this message, that is we must all face the reality, all of us face the reality that without faith in the Lord, we cannot ever be assured of a future in heaven. And therefore, I may not be speaking to those of you that know for certain that you're, you're, you've trusted in Jesus Christ. But it says in first, second Corinthians, second, yeah, second Corinthians chapter 13, that we should Examine our faith to make sure that it's real. I'm sad to say I believe in our world today there are many, many people that are unconverted believers. They believe that Jesus came. They believe that Jesus died on a cross. They believe that Jesus was a good man. They have all kinds of different thoughts about Jesus. They also believe that Jesus endorses sin and endorses things that are just absolutely immoral. And there are a lot of people, it says in James chapter 2, that even the devil believes in Jesus. But the devil is lost. The devil is, he's, he's bound for the lake of fire. 
He's a fallen angel. And therefore, assure, we, need, we need to be assured of our faith in Jesus Christ. I'll say this last point one more time, this last application. We must all face the reality that without faith in the Lord, we cannot ever be assured of a future in heaven. So take it seriously. If your life, if you think, okay, I walked an aisle when I was 12 years old and I trusted in Jesus, if you think that's sufficient, realize that if your faith isn't completely dependent upon Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and He's leading your life today, if the Holy Spirit does not indwell you, we're going to get back to that in a couple weeks in, the, in, in Romans 8. If the Holy Spirit is not leading and guiding our lives, basically the Bible says we don't have Christ. So let's be assured that our faith is in the right place. We have faith in lots of things, but our faith must be in Christ and in Christ alone, in his death, his burial, and his resurrection, as my substitute, as your substitute, as the only, the exclusive provision that God has made so that we can be rescued from the penalty, the power, and the problem of sin. Easter is a wonderful time to celebrate. We celebrate new birth. We celebrate the new life in Christ. Let's make sure that we all have it. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this time. Thank you for the truth of your word. I thank you that you love us with love that is beyond what we could ever really imagine. I know you're in charge. I know you have absolute control over this world. But for some reason or another, your love for mankind says, I'm going to give mankind a sense of freedom, freedom of choice. Freedom of desire. Freedom of doing what they want. And your scripture says very clearly that if we want things that aren't right, you're going to make us pay for it. But Father, thank you for Jesus and thank you for what he did for us on the cross. Thank you for the fact that he came back from the grave. We praise you, we love you, we honor you, and we worship you. And Father, help us to go out and tell others the great wondrous news of Jesus Christ. May that have an impact on everyone that surrounds our lives, Father. They see in us the fact that the resurrected Christ lives in us through the power of the Spirit. And that we are changed, we're different, we're not like the rest of society. Not by our power, but by the power, the resurrection power of Jesus living in our lives. Thank you, we praise you, we love you. And we pray these things in Jesus' precious and powerful name. Again, all God's people said, amen. Thanks for watching. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Lord bless. Have a great week. We've got the Awana Grand Prix this coming Friday night. We've got many various other things happening here in our church. And uh, we'd love to see you come and, and, and visit us. Come and see us. Come, come and join in in the activities. So thank you for watching. Thanks again for your support. Lord bless and have a happy Easter.